I'm Jim Shaw. I'm the chairman of the board of Lex Media and publisher of the Lexington Times Magazine. I'm um, pleased and honored to be here with uh, Congresswoman Catherine Clark, or Assistant Speaker Catherine Clark, um, elected to Congress in 2013 after serving um, terms in both the Massachusetts House and the Massachusetts Senate. Right. Uh, I know you were elected um, uh, in a special election when Ed Markey was uh, appointed to the U.S. Senate. Um, right so That's far exactly right Jim. <laughs> i remember being with you uh for the um the little rally here in lexington the first day of the uh, of the uh, general election campaign that's right we, we had here a unity with rally with, a unity rally with senator donnelly um i remember being here for that um in 2018 um, your colleagues elected you vice chair of the democratic caucus um in in what was really not an easy election because you were you were challenging somebody it wasn't like you walked into this position <laughs> so you really you you earned the respect and support of of the members and again in 2021 they elected you assistant speaker um of the house of representatives which is the fourth ranking position um for the democratic party That's in right. the united states house of representatives so congratulations on that and as I said before, when we started, I'm so pleased and honored that, you know, that our Congresswoman from, from here who represents Lexington is now on the national stage, making it, making a big difference. So um, welcome, welcome. I should say welcome back to Lexington. Oh. I know you're, you're no stranger. Yeah, but Jim, it is so good to be here and thank you for having me. And it's wonderful to be right here in Lexington <laughs> where right. our democracy really, uh, really began. So mm -hmm. it's a pleasure to be here with you. Great. I know you were here uh, when we when you were announcing the funding for electric buses. That's right. Here. And um, so your you know your your work here is um, is seen constantly. So thank you for that. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to talk to you initially was back when when um, the House passed the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, it was difficult for anybody at that point to get, it was crazy in Washington at that point. And I do, and I do remember that the president hadn't yet signed it. It had to go to the Senate and there was a lot of questions about what would happen in the Senate. Um, but now it's here. And, um, so I was hoping we could talk a little bit about the climate, um, change sure. aspect of that. Um, more, more, you know, more specifically the sort of green manufacturing, the jobs and, and what it means for climate change. Yeah, it's really hard to overstate the mm -hmm. impact of this bill on, on climate change. Mm -hmm. This is a historic investment, over $370 billion into making sure that we are building resilience, that we are creating gr great paying green jobs, and that we are really preserving what we have going on right here in this congressional district in being leaders in uh, sustainable energy mm -hmm. and building renewable technology. And so we want to keep that global preeminence mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that every homeowner, that every consumer can also afford mm -hmm. to move to clean energy. Mm -hmm. So in this bill, not only do we have investments in the electrical grid, in electric vehicle infrastructure, so there are chargers on the highways so people can travel in a cleaner way and reduce mm -hmm. our dependence on foreign oil, but also to make sure that you can afford a heat pump or solar panels or right. an electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. And all of that is built into this investment in this bill mm -hmm. and will help us reduce our carbon footprint by 40% mm -hmm. by 2030. And that's a huge achievement. It's a huge achievement. That's something we need to do. It is absolutely imperative. And this bill reflects the urgency that Democrats and the American people feel around this issue. Mm -hmm. As we're watching wildfires in California, floods right. in Kentucky, devastating drought across the country, including mm -hmm. here in Massachusetts. Right. We know that climate change and its effects are already with us. And mm -hmm. this bill is saying we see that and we're taking decisive action. Right. Lexington is a fairly progressive community and they've been sort of at the, you know, at the front of the, the, the campaign for, no. for a very long time, trying to make some of these things happen on a, on a local level. Um, and I think by, by having this legislation now, it really helps bolster, um, you know, the potential 
of what they were doing, you know, sort of teaming up with, with, fed, yeah. with the federal government. And, and, and this is for real. There, there are real benefits here. People can, can um, reach out to find more information about this, I mean, even if they had to just call your office. Absolutely. Yeah. We're going to see these programs that are going to help consumers, help residents in Lexington and mm -hmm. around the country afford some of these technologies right. and really make sure that we are able to move to cleaner, efficient ways to heat mm -hmm. and cool our homes, to drive our cars, right. um, appliances that make sense from an energy perspective. Right. All of that is got help in this bill. Right. And so people shouldn't hesitate as these programs come together right. to contact us, learn more about right. how they can access these programs. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. Yeah. Lexington has been a leader. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it led the state for some time, may still, in solar panels on residents. Um, and you have really understood that it starts locally mm -hmm. and it is long overdue, but finally here with the help of the Biden administration mm -hmm. and the Democrats in right. Congress, that we are giving that support federally, right. which is and, and this is well this needed. is real. This is not just fantasy land. I mean, like like the like the the, the, the legislation. The president was in Ohio talking about the the plant for building electric car batteries. That's right. So this is this is absolutely for real. We're going to be doing it here in this country, and I know that there's a major buy-in from from all of the major uh, automobile manufacturers. That's right. To convert to electric vehicles. People understand that yeah. this is the future and that we want to be leaders, mm -hmm. not only in addressing climate change, right. but in addressing changes in consumer behavior and making that affordable for families. Right. Pa families want to be able to make cleaner choices and help the environment and leave a planet and an, an economy for their children and grandchildren. Right. But those costs can be prohibitive. So this bill is going to go a long way to creating that competition mm -hmm. that will drive down prices and creating subsidies so consumers can afford these new technologies. Right. The Inflation Reduction Act was sort of an all-encompassing piece of legislation. So beyond climate change, and I know that was an important plank within the yeah. legislation, um, lowering health care costs was a big thing. The, the cost of prescription medication for seniors. Um, this is for real. Again, you know, we, we, we've been talking about this and, you know, for years and years, it's been a lot of hyperbole about who does this and who doesn't, you know, why can't we do it? We're actually doing it now. Yeah. And I mean, this has been our strategy. Let's put people over politics, right. people over pharma. Um, and with this bill, we've made good on that promise. Mm -hmm. This will be the first time that we are able to negotiate the cost of prescription drugs uh, for Medicare recipients. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna be a huge savings. Right. We've also put in a cap so that seniors won't have to spend more than $2,000 a year out of pocket. This is very important to a constituent who contacted me named Barry, mm -hmm. whose wife was going through cancer treatments. And what the drugs she needed cost $3,000 a month in out of pocket costs for that family. That's devastating. And with this bill, those costs will be contained to $2,000 a year. That makes a real difference for people in their lives, especially for our seniors, often living on fixed incomes in making ends meet and being able to have the health care that they need. Mm -hmm. And the bill goes farther, a $35 a month cap on the cost of insulin. Um, again, diabetes is a huge issue across the country and right here in the Commonwealth. And this will help say to companies who want to jack up prices for the bottom line of these companies over the needs of people that we're saying no more mm -hmm. and that prices have to be set with inflationary costs in mind and that there will be penalties for overpricing these drugs. So this bill is, is helping immediately people be able to afford healthcare that they need, keep the costs of their premiums down, and not have to make those choices that I hear about every day. People who are choosing food for their family or the prescription drugs they need, a roof over their house or 
the, the health care that they need. And so this is a big step to saying to the American people, we see the challenges you're facing, the high costs you're dealing with, and we are coming forward with solutions. Is it is it safe to assume that once we do it through Medicare, you know, is it something then we can look beyond Medicare to the to the bigger world of Absolutely. medication? Medicare is our starting point, but certainly not our end point. Right. But even with, you know, having many of these cost savings limited right. to Medicare recipients, right. here in, in MA5, right. that would be an approximate savings of $30 million a year mm -hmm. for seniors on Medicare in our district. That's real Huge money. Important. And it's hugely important. Mm -hmm. So with everything in this bill, despite its historic investment, it's a starting point, but it is one that we can build on and that we know the American people and the people of Lexington are going to support when they see these benefits and the difference it makes in the quality of life. Before we segue into a couple of other quick issues, can you tell me a little bit about what you, you talk about historic investment? It's got to be paid for. And, and, and I know that there's been provisions placed into the legislation that will help pay for this. Absolutely. Uh, one of them is just negotiating the cost of prescription drugs. Right. That's a huge savings to the federal government. Right. But the other is making our tax system fair. Right. We know that working families pay, or pay their fair share. It is high right. time that large corporations pay theirs. Mm -hmm. So there is a 15% minimum tax that's going to make sure that big corporations like Amazon that have gotten away with paying no taxes for many years are also paying their fair share and helping, right. uh, you know, helping our communities and everyone in that community have a chance at opportunity, have health care that they need, and protect our planet and economy going forward. Right. Well, you know, the, um, the everything seems to be getting a little brighter these days. You know, the price of gasoline is coming down yeah. um, finally, um, and. Um, you know, young young people are beginning to feel, a, you know, a breathe a sigh of relief in that regard. But even further, the the um, the, um, the, um, the student loan yeah. uh, forgiveness program that the president has um, signed. Yeah. Um, how how do, how did what does that mean for for students? I mean, we giving them a head start. I mean, I know as somebody who had student loans and my wife had student loans, everybody had student loans. Everybody had to put their life on hold years and years ago while they were able to deal with, you know, the impact of their student loans. Yeah. Um, some some did, but some didn't do so well with it. I mean, it, it, it was, for some folks, it was a lifelong thing where they're, you know, they're, they're dealing with it into their adult years. Exactly. And, um, but for young people getting started, it could mean home ownership. It could mean a whole lot of other things. A whole lot of other things. And yes, yeah. this helps um, the, the people who are carrying this debt. And this was a promise that President Biden made during the campaign uh, and has kept his word. Mm -hmm. And I think what it means to people who hold student loans is relief. Many of these folks never actually graduated from college and were able to get the economic benefits of that degree, right. but they are saddled with the debt. Right. And so this is really a lifeline for them. And what does it mean for those of us in the community who paid off our student loans? Mm -hmm. It means they're gonna be able to start a business right. or buy a home, uh, be able to provide for their families. It's mm -hmm. all, it helps all of us in our economy right. by this investment in the student loan holders. Mm -hmm. And again, it's beginning. We're not done tackling right. the high costs of higher education. Right. We're not done saying, let's look at our apprenticeship programs mm -hmm. and our secondary education system and create great pathways to jobs that right. may not need a four-year mm -hmm. or a two-year college experience. Sure. So, But this is mm -hmm. a critical piece as we are looking at creating a post-pandemic economy where everybody can see opportunity for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, with post-secondary education, um, you know, it really does give young people a, a head start, and they um, getting saddled with the the inability to pay. You know, young, young my son lives in in um, in the city, or some of them, 
um, and the cost of rent in Somerville. Yeah, it's just it's just crazy, you know. And they it's it's very very challenging for these folks to to get out of the gate. So, yeah, and and th this legislation that breaks down like this, there are a couple of ways to it. One is you know there, it was a ten thousand dollar forgiveness initially, and I know other folks, and I don't know where you came in on the mix, but other folks wanted to, like Senator Warren would wanted to just erase it altogether. Um, and then for Pell Grant recipients, it's even higher. That's right. It can be another twenty thousand. Okay. And and there is an income cap at one hundred and twenty five thousand. Mm -hmm. But again, this is a real beginning right. and and really a chance to say to so many of you know the people that hold this student loan, we want you to have a future. Right. And this is good for our economy. It's good for communities, mm -hmm. and it's good for folks who have. And the these process loans. is about to open up. Yeah, so the, right. the application process, forgiveness. I'm not sure if it's officially started yet, but it's about to. Yes, there okay. will be a regulatory uh, process as we put this program together. Okay. But you know, relief is coming soon. Okay. Um, I know we have a fairly limited amount of time, so but there are a couple of things I really wanted to uh, touch base on. Um, the Dobbs decision mm. um, had a huge impact. Um, it set us back at least 50 years, maybe more. Yeah. Um, you know, just based, I mean, not, notwithstanding just the issue of reproductive rights for women. Um, so what, what's in the future? I mean, what are we, what are we looking forward to in, in Congress? Uh, is Congress going to try to do something to, you know, to re not necessarily remedy that because it's a, it was a, it was a Supreme Court decision, and I, I consider it legislating from the bench, which I, you know, I thought goes against the grain yeah. of, you know, the separate um, departments of government. At any rate, yeah. so what are your thoughts on that? So what we have here is a dramatic rollback of rights right. and a denial of freedom uh, for women in this country, for people who are pregnant, uh, and, but also for everyone, because this is saying that a very personal decision about if and when to have children is now not something you make with your family, with your doctor, in accordance with your faith, but we're gonna have politicians come into your doctor's office and make those decisions for you. Right. And people understand that is fundamentally taking away their personal liberty and autonomy, and that this is about control. And I can tell you that my colleagues across the aisle are not done with just the Dobbs decision. Right. They are actively talking about a full federal ban on any abortion services, mm -hmm. and they are in support of criminalization. And we're already starting to see that play out mm -hmm. in certain states. Right. Uh, it is breathtaking well, to Texas be on the house of the floor right. in 2022 and watch people vote against, as every Republican did, uh, that we should keep women safe when traveling state to state seeking right. health care. I mean, mm -hmm. just let that sink in. Right. And women understand and families understand that this is an outrageous overstep of government into their personal lives. Mm -hmm. And that this is something that we all have to do everything we can to push against. Right. In the House, we have passed the Women's Health Protection Act. We passed it in September of 21. We passed it again in July. Mm -hmm. We need to elect enough members of the Senate that we can get it through past a filibuster and into law right. so that we can push back against the Supreme Court decision mm -hmm. and the state laws that we are seeing. And we also are not, uh, not resting with that right. because we've read Justice Alito's decision and we know that um, he has set out, um, Justice Thomas set out right. that also marriage equality. It's a foot in the door situation. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, that so many other rights are also on the chopping block. Right. So we have passed legislation protecting the right to marry, protecting marriage equality that has its roots here in Massachusetts. And right. we, will, we will defend people's families and their marriages. We are going to defend birth control and make sure that people are able to access right. medications that they need and healthcare services 
in the full band. Mm -hmm. And we're doing this with the Biden administration. Right. But it is a fight. And I think that what the Republicans uh, have underestimated is that people understand this connection mm -hmm. between their fundamental liberties and freedoms and this decision. Right. And they know whose side uh, Democrats are on. Right. And it's on the side of your family and right. making these decisions yourself. Right. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> I feel so much better knowing that, that you're there and, and fighting this fight. Um, I remember years ago, it was around the time of the Roe decision, um, a fellow named Bill Baird was arrested at Boston University for, for distributing um, contraception. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's, you know, that's when, within our lifetime, you know, that's we right. and that's the thing. We don't want to roll back to those times that's because we right. remember what it was like. And this is, you know, as you said, Jim, this is a rollback that going back 50 years. Mm -hmm. And there have been many Supreme Court decisions where we did not move forward right. like we should in, in a, on a path for equality and justice. Right. But this decision stands out and that it is taken away a fundamental right that mm -hmm. has been accessible for people uh, right. for 50 years. And right. that should alarm everyone. Right. And, uh, and what we're seeing in public opinion polls is the American people's support for access to abortion is right. growing right. in light of this decision. And the numbers are up in the, in the 70s now of people who believe that abortion should be fully accessible. Right. So this is a huge misstep with mm -hmm. where the American people are, and they are seeing through the rhetoric and getting to the heart of it, which is a denial of freedom right. and exerting control over people's most intimate personal decisions. Maybe it will resonate in November. Yes. Let's close out with a little, little discussion about your role in leadership now. Yeah. Um, since 2013, I think what many would consider a meteoric rise <laughs> um, into the, the fourth ranking position um, in the Democratic Party, basically um, in the House of Representatives, um, just behind the majority whip. Um, assistant Speaker, you have the, the Speaker. Like, so the leadership team is essentially the Speaker, the Assistant Speaker, you have the Majority Leader and Majority Whip. Right. So you've got a seat at the table. That's, that's exactly it. And yeah. you know, that's why I ran for leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and why I am grateful to my peers for letting me be there. Mm -hmm. I am, uh, you know, the only Nancy Pelosi has been higher in House leadership in the history of Congress. Mm -hmm. And why does it matter? Because when women are at the table, right. the conversation changes. Right. And it gives me a chance to bring the stories of families from here right. in Lexington and across my district mm -hmm. to that table. Right. And I ran for Congress to be an advocate for families, for women, for children. Right. And so whether it's issues of childcare, getting lead pipes um, out of our communities, clean water, all of these mm -hmm. issues change right. when you are at that table bringing these stories with you. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of being in leadership and why it's been so rewarding mm -hmm. to come from our incredible district, which I can say with full confidence is the nice. best in the country, mm -hmm. um, and be able to bring those stories and experiences that I hear about every day right. from constituents to that leadership table and not mm -hmm. just talk about it, but take action and right. help plan the agenda. I, and I'm, I don't know for the life of me how you balance it all up because we haven't, I mean, we see you here. You're not, you know, even in your role in leadership in Washington, you're still here in the district. You well, know, we see you all the time. You it's, know, it's the not stories, like it, yeah. you know, it is the stories and the people of this district that fuels my work and my passion. Yeah. And it is the women I meet who would love to return to work but they simply can't find the childcare they need. Right. You know, the mom in Medford who um, was so desperate during the pandemic to get into her closed childcare because there were extra diapers there right. and she simply could not afford diapers right. for her child. I mean, these are compelling stories that happen throughout our district as mm -hmm. well as incredible scientific discoveries and leading in technology right. and uh, incredible academic institutions. So all of that 
is what I can bring as a representation of the people of this district and also of the American people and bring their stories and voices into Congress where very often the doors are closed and guarded by special interests. Well, thank you. There's so much more I could go on, but I know we have a limited time. So um, uh, Assistant Speaker Clark, Catherine Clark, thank you so much for, for coming to Lexington and sitting with us and talking about some of these issues. Thank you um, for inviting me, Jim. Yeah. It is always good to be here and always good to see you. Well, uh, you know, I love every once in a while we'll text back and forth and it's very <laughs> meaningful to me. I always say to Laurie, when I, I get a text back, I was so excited. For instance, when you were with Congressman Lewis on the floor and during the sit-in yeah. on gun violence, I texted you, you texted back. And I thought, <laughs> here's a woman who's so busy, but she finds the time just to at least send a, a couple of sentences back. So yeah. um, we appreciate it and thank you for all your hard work. Oh, thank you, Jim. Thank you.